just in the United States right now, there are 100,000 undercover covert operatives collecting secrets, adding that to the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, China. All of a sudden you can see that there are millions of spies in the world. What are you not allowed to say? <laughs> A lot. If you think about all the conspiracy theorists out there who talk about CIA selling drugs in Latin America, if that's true, if the drug selling created revenue, that revenue would have to be accounted for. We roll that revenue that's coming in into the budget that CIA can use to fund other operations. And now we have the opportunity for operations in, say, Colombia to fund operations in Afghanistan. The number of people leaving CIA has skyrocketed. CIA is losing as many as one undercover officer per day. And a lot of things contribute to that. Donald Trump presidency, the continued strife between left and right, and mental health is one of the largest challenges at CIA and physical manifestations of your anxiety. So drug abuse, alcohol abuse, adultery, those types of behaviors naturally spring out of this lack of mental health that's, that many officers have to endure. We're starting to get into a classified area, so I can't give you the exact answer. Who are you? <laughs> My name is Andrew Bustamante. I'm a former CIA intelligence officer, and I am the founder of Everyday Spy. Okay. What does CIA spy means, really means? So that's a great question. Uh, a lot of people get what CIA does wrong because they believe what they see in the movies and what they read about in books and newspapers. In reality, CIA's job is to secure national security secrets that keep Americans safe against foreign powers. So CIA steals secrets from human beings who are not Americans in order to keep America safe. Uh, can you give me an example of that? Absolutely. So if you think about uh, uh, a military general or maybe a nuclear scientist who is in charge of a foreign program that's designed to target U.S. military, U.S. security infrastructure, power grids, cybersecurity, etc., If you think about that person as a foreign adversary for a country that's hostile to the United States, CIA's job is to find that person and then find a way to get that person to share their secrets, how the nuclear uh, uh, missile works or what the nuclear codes might be or what military movements are being moved from what cities to what, uh, what other cities, what weapons might be at their disposal. Secrets about trade, secrets about technology, secrets about industry and, and uh, infrastructure. Uh, that's what CIA is looking for. So it's not only secrets to prevent the uh, United States from danger. It's secrets maybe to give an edge to the United States. In that's a great point. That's exactly it. What, what every secret is, a secret is an opportunity to have an unfair advantage over your opponent. Because what's publicly known, what you know and what I know is what makes us equal. It's what you know that I don't know that makes us unequal. So if I can get access to the thing that you know that I don't know, now I know your secret, but you don't know that I know your secret. And that gives me an edge. Okay, and uh, so there is thousands of spies doing this at the current moment that we are doing, maybe hundreds of thousands. And it's a fascinating idea, right? So the, the unclassified number, the number that's, that's publicly known, is that just in the United States right now, there are 100,000 undercover covert operatives collecting secrets. And that includes American CIA and the undercover officers of every other country in the world as well, just inside the United States. So if you could imagine taking that number and adding that to the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, Australia, New Zealand, all of a sudden you can see that there are many, many millions of spies in the world. And I'm very curious to understand how the system works. Like there is so many people who controls all the information and how the information escalates to the decision making in a way. 
So it's funny, we call the CIA the company. You've probably heard that before in, in media and also internally. Um, and that's a, that's a true term that we really do use to refer to ourselves. We call ourselves the company. And the reason we call ourselves the company is because CIA is structured very much like a corporate company, like Nike or Adidas or McDonald's or, uh, or Wendy's, right? There's a large group of people who work at the bottom and a few people who work at the very top. And it's all the people at the bottom who are in charge of finding information, collecting information, comparing information, analyzing it, synthesizing it, combining it, correlating it, making it into something useful. We call useful information a product, just like a company calls something useful a product. So once the intelligence worker bees at the bottom find enough secrets, connect enough dots, they are able to create an intelligence product. Usually it's in the form of a report or an assessment or some kind of document that gives a, a realistic uh, analysis or a realistic prediction of what might happen in the future. They then give that product to the higher level or middle level management. At the middle level of CIA's company, all those products are compared and combined again. Keep in mind that a big difference between CIA and a normal company is that a normal company has no secrets. They have industry secrets, but they don't have secrets that they have to protect from people within the company. Whereas for us, every little, every vertical of information, your here's, you know, secrets about China, secrets about Russia, secrets about uh, France, secrets about Israel, all these different verticals have to be compartmentalized. They have to be kept secret from one another. So when the products are built, the products include just one vertical and they go to a, a separate level of management. That level of management is the first level that can actually compare products. Here's what we know is happening in Turkey. Here's what we know is happening in Iran. Let's compare them. Everybody beneath that isn't allowed to know what's happening in both countries. And you can see how that combination process happens as it continues to go up the chain until you get to the director of CIA, who's able to know everything that everybody else in the company knows. And who funds the company? The company is funded by taxpayer dollars in the United States. It's actually interesting, Phidias, there's a combination. The reason it's called a black budget is, two, is twofold. It's a black budget because you have uh, a, a, a giant pot of national security money that comes from the taxpayers of America that fund the national security infrastructure, specifically covert human intelligence infrastructure at CIA. That's bucket number one of the black budget. But then CIA also runs operations that can produce money because they have people working undercover. Some of those people undercover are running functional businesses. Some of those people operating undercover are running consultancies or they're running manufacturing plants or they're doing trade in real life, right? So they have money that comes in as a part of their operation. If you think about all the conspiracy theorists out there who talk about uh, CIA selling drugs in Latin America, right? If that's true or not, I don't know. I was never active in any kind of operation like that. But if that was true, if the drug selling created revenue, that revenue would have to be accounted for because it's money that's coming in. So how do we do that? We roll that revenue that's coming in into the budget that CIA can use to fund other operations. And now we have the opportunity for operations in say Colombia to fund operations in Afghanistan, right? And that's part of why that budget is kept black because it's confidential, it's classified. It's not information that the public should be allowed to see because we don't want our adversaries to see it. Wow. So there is actually uh, CIA spies creating businesses to look that they are creating business to get the relevant information. Correct. And it's not that they look like they're doing it. They are truly doing it. Uh, and that's that's one of the things that makes working at CIA so fascinating is it really is a challenge on multiple levels. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> uh, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If CIA, you think it's a net positive, 
in in the world in America in general in the world because probably it's net positive in America but maybe it's dominant in the whole humanity as a whole I don't know yeah it's a it's another really good question it's a question I've I've only really thought about from the American perspective so I might stumble through this one a little bit without a doubt it's a net positive for America without a doubt I would also say that it's a net positive for the Western powers. It's a net positive for European powers and for the five eyes countries and for the United States, obviously. So the opportunity, the advantage that CIA gets because they're so good at what they do helps not just the United States, but it helps all of our allies as well. It is, it is without a doubt a massive uh, hindrance, a damage to all of our adversaries. So any country that's trying to oppose the United States, CIA does damage to those countries. It's hard for them to keep their secrets. They lose their edge. When it comes to the whole world, here's what I'll say. I believe that the United States is the best qualified of all current countries to be the world leader. I believe that the idea of democracy, the idea of, of human rights, the promise of capitalism and open markets... That is the best of all the solutions we have presently. But I will also say that the United States is not perfect. We may be the best right now, but that doesn't mean we're going to continue to be the best in the future. So for that reason, I would say that CIA is a net benefit to all of mankind right now because it is aiding and, and assisting in the predominant power being the United States. As soon as the CIA fails in their duties or another country takes the dominant position over the United States, we run the risk of having a very different world and a very different uh, semblance of humankind. Interesting. Uh, while you were talking, I was thinking about uh, what's the role of a spy or spies in the Ukraine war or in the Israel war? Do they have a hand inside? So this is actually a fantastic question because the United States has not claimed to be active in uh, per, in any kind of uh, field espionage in Israel, Hamas or Ukraine, Russia. And because they haven't claimed it publicly, we have to accept that we're not allowed to know. Logically, it makes sense that there are American spies active in both war zones, but we don't know for sure. But here's what we do know for sure. What we do know for sure is that intelligence is being collected by the United States from those war zones. Now, intelligence comes in all different varieties. It can come from signals intelligence, measurements intelligence, open source intelligence, military intelligence. It can come in a multitude of different ways from satellites to radios to airplanes to you know what, right? Uh, what we are seeing is that the intelligence that's being collected by the United States is creating an edge for both Israel and Ukraine, the two countries that are most closely allied to the United States in both conflicts. So we see in very real terms how valuable, how, how much of an edge intelligence can create, even though it's not a bullet or a knife or a rocket or a missile. And we're talking about information now, only information. What information can do to a war? If you have the location exactly. of Putin, the exact location of Putin, you can throw a missile there. And like, it's all about collecting the right information. Correct. And then information itself can be a weapon, right? Not only can information give you the insights that you need so that you can take action, information itself can be the action, information warfare, right? When you can tell, uh, Russia is a fantastic example. When you find a way to give the Russian people real, true information that their government is keeping from them, you create a weapon out of information. Similarly, if you can get someone to believe false information about their government or about something else, again, you are weaponizing information. So information can be used both defensively and offensively. Okay. And let's get into the interesting stuff. So <laughs> I am... Um, I am a finished uh, 
Navy SEAL in my country, Cyprus. So I finished the eight uh, months of Navy SEAL school. Out of a hundred people, we only 13 finish the Navy SEAL school. So I have uh, an experience with the um, difficult military training. And I'm curious to compare and understand the similarities uh, with the CIA training. So I'll tell you right now that the one of the reasons, uh, Phidias, that I've I've been following you for over a year. And one of the reasons is because you have a very unique and rare capacity for pain and suffering and, and discomfort. Most people can't tolerate pain and discomfort to the level that you can. And many of your YouTube videos have gone very, have gone viral, have been very popular because you put yourself in these uncomfortable positions and then you sustain the discomfort and you document the journey. Whether that's standing outside in the rain in front of uh, in front of SpaceX or burying yourself or going without food or, you know, whatever, any number of crazy things that you've done. You have a very natural high pain tolerance. When you talk about any kind of paramilitary tier one special operator, one of the main things that a government is looking for is individuals who have that high pain tolerance because a lot of your training involves extreme temperatures, working under duress, being fatigued, putting up with, you know, with being punched and kicked and starved and all sorts of terrible, un um, uncomfortable experiences. In contrast to that, your elite intelligence services are not elite paramilitary services. So they're not looking for people who have a high pain tolerance. They're looking for people who have a high cognitive ability. So when you compare CIA training to, say, SEAL training in your country or even here in the United States, our officers aren't expected or put into a training program that tests their pain tolerance. We are put through some training that gives us the experience of what it would be like to be captured, what it would be like to be interrogated, what it might feel like to have light or, or uh, uh, light levels of pain motivation. But we're not being tortured. We're not being um attested to the level of a tier one seal or a delta officer or a marsoc officer so uh, the difference is that there is not is not focused on suffering and pain is most the suffer uh, mostly focused on the intelligent staff uh, but i'm curious to understand what does that mean so uh, what is the training really look like on the intelligence side if it's not on the physical training and all this stuff that the navy seals are focused that's a that's, that's perfect question. The, the vast majority of our training is about human psychology and it's not academic. It's not like going to college for psychology. It's more like learning applied psychology. How do you learn and use how people think, how people behave, how people interact, how people communicate? How do you learn to understand that? And then how do you learn to turn that against your opponent so that you can take control psychologically in situations one on one or situations one on a small group or situations one versus a large group? Because ultimately, intelligence is something we call the gentleman's game. And it's called the gentleman's game because when you're really doing intelligence well, people who are giving you secrets actually enjoy talking to you. They, they see you as a enjoyable, pleasant person. Uh, it's the, the more someone sees you as a threat, the more someone sees you as someone they should be afraid of, the more someone distrusts you, the less likely they are to share confidential information. So for us, and we have training that, that lasts nearly a full year, it's all psychological. And then even when we are doing the physical side of our training, whether it's driving or shooting or medical or whatever else, we are constantly being tested psychologically also because we have to be able to, under that duress, we have to be able to not only control the information that we have, but we also have to be able to retain the information that we've collected in our operation. So it's difficult when you're hungry and you're tired and you're cold and you're wet and you're, and you're in a survival situation. You're not only protecting the secrets that you yourself know, but you're also protecting all of the secrets from the information that you've collected from your sources previous 
to this point in your training? Uh, when I was in the army, I, actually the people that got selected didn't have this ability that you are talking about. Uh, we selected only uh, some stupid people, but very physically amazing so, and accept the people that are, accept suffering. So, but I'm curious, how is the selection process? So, because in the Navy SEALs, if you cannot take it, you ring the bell and you leave. But like, how is the selection process in the CIA? That's a great, you've got to consider the, the timeline for each different type of, uh, of application, right? Your Navy SEALs, your elite special operators, even here in the United States, their application process is generally very short, comparatively, between 60 days and maybe four months. So you can apply to be a Navy SEAL and about four months later, you can be placed in a Navy, a Navy SEAL training cast class and you're already there. Part of that is because they're really only recruiting Navy SEALs from people who are in the Navy. It's there with very few exceptions. Can you apply directly to the Navy SEALs? I'm sure it's like that in your home country, too. In CIA, they are literally taking applications from everyone, people in the military, people who are teachers, people who are doctors, people who are students. So you can go from from any point of your life to joining the CIA but the application process is much longer. It averages 12 to 16 months. I was a military officer. My application, my enrollment, my onboarding only took nine months because I already had a, a security clearance. I was already military. I was already known by the US government. Even with all of that, it still took nine months for my full battery of psychological testing, physical testing, mental health, uh, knowledge and IQ testing. It still took me nine months. I have many, many friends who took more than 18 months before they were recruited because that process is very selective and very much focused on your cognitive capacities, not just your cognitive capacities to, let's say, uh, uh, build a relationship, steal a secret, you know, et cetera. But you also have to have a strong memory. You have to be able to have a trainable memory. You have to be able to have a very flexible or what we call a plastic brain, which means that your brain can switch gears and learn something very complicated in a very short period of time. So whether you're learning a new language or whether you're learning the layout of a new city, you have to have a very flexible brain. Some people's cognitive abilities are very rigid. So it's hard for them to, to change from one subject to another, abandon one thing that they were learning and start learning something completely different. All of that has to come out during that initial round of testing so that when you start training, the training curriculum will work. Otherwise, if you bring the wrong person in, the training curriculum won't work. And that's what you see with the bell in Navy SEALs. They, they have a higher tolerance for bringing people in that may not be the right fit, but they trust that the people who are the wrong fit will ring the bell, self-select, and get out of the training program. Uh, do we know currently the rate of uh, success rate of the CIA, like out of the 100 people that want to become and they apply and they maybe do the training, how many, uh, per what's the percentage that they succeed to become a CIA spy? Yeah, I don't know the exact number, but here's what I'll tell you happened to me. Um, and there's a, there's a significant difference between when I started at CIA in 2007 and what CIA looks like today in 2024. So in 2007, when I went through my training program, you know, we were we were briefed and, and our first uh, our first briefing, our first introduction. Welcome to CIA. You you are now starting your training program. They told us to look to our left and look to our right, because when we look to our left and to our right, only one of those two people would still be there by the end of the program. So. In reality, I think what they meant was someplace between 60 and 70% success rate, meaning 60 to 70% of the people who started stayed in CIA. They completed their training and were able to stay in CIA in some sort of role. Uh, but at that time in history, back in 2007, almost nobody was leaving CIA. The attrition rate was very, very low, beneath 1% attrition. The only people who were ever leaving were basically people who were very senior, who were retiring, 
And then those, the vast majority of the people who retired would then come back as a contractor or come back as a civilian in some other way. So that was 2007. What we do know started happening in 2021, 2022 and beyond is that CIA's attrition rate, the number of people leaving CIA has skyrocketed. Some of the figures that I've heard recently are that CIA is losing as many as one undercover officer per day. That means at least one undercover officer per day is choosing to quit CIA or separate from CIA. Uh, that puts the attrition at closer to 7 to 10 percent, which is much, much higher than the less than 1 percent of 2007. And a lot of things contribute to that. The end of the war in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, the Donald Trump presidency, the continued strife between left and right that's kind of overtaking American politics. All of that is it's making people less enthusiastic about the ideological commitments to serving in government at all, and let alone to serving inside CIA. So CIA is suffering from higher than normal attrition, which leads me to suspect that they are more flexible with some of their standards bringing people on because they have to always bring on for every one person you lose, you have to bring in at least two or three because you already know that of the two or three that you bring in, one of them will not pass the training and what are you going to do to maintain a positive growth structure rather than a negative decay? So as I understand, the success rate is, uh, is a bit uh, fishy here. Like it's not the accurate because it's a very selective process of the applications. So, and it's, a class uh, and it's classified information. Uh, so we don't know actually what's the success rate of someone that is trying to become a CIA spy. So uh, I'm curious to what what is the hardest part uh, of your training, uh, uh, you think? So I'll, I'll tell you this. The training is actually very fun. Uh, it's it's really when you're the right fit. It's a ton of fun. You you learn how to lie. You learn how to cheat. You learn how people think. <laughs> You learn how to manipulate people's thoughts. I mean, I'm telling you, man, it's it's a lot of fun. And then you learn how to drive and how to shoot and how to repel and how to do all sorts of crazy, cool stuff that nobody ever gets to learn. So I'll say that the training is is fun. The hard part about the training is the endurance element of it, because you in order to complete the training, in order to, to transition into an undercover life, you have to leave everything you've ever known behind. All of your high school friends, your college friends, your peers, your church, your, uh, you know, even your your family. You start lying to your parents. You start lying to your sisters and your brothers. Some why people lie to why you do that? Lie. Because you don't, nobody needs to know that uh, you are in the CIA, right? Right. Because when you're undercover, your cover has to be maintained. It has to be protected against any any threat. And you, you hit it on the head, need to know. There, that's a very real policy inside CIA. Who has the need to know? And oftentimes that need to know does not extend to your mom or your dad or your husband or your wife or your kids. So you become very isolated and the, they train you how to maintain multiple lies at one time so that you can lie to all these different people. But there is to probably do that some mental period. health uh, issues of people that because when you are going in bed with your wife and she doesn't know how, why was it up that day for you <laughs> might cause some problems. Yeah. And, and mental health is one of the largest challenges at CIA. Mental health and then the association of mental health um, and unhealthy mental life balance and then the natural chemical um, and physical manifestations of your anxiety. So drug abuse, alcohol abuse, adultery, um, you know, those types of behaviors naturally spring out of the stress and the lack of mental health that's that many officers have to endure. Uh, so I cut you off of uh, explaining the training a bit and like what is the hardest part? You said that it's fun, but... Mm, uh, but I cut you off. Continue. With it's the saying. endurance. Yeah, it's the endurance element of the training. It's the fact that you are 
you're doing this not for hours at a time. I mean, just think about how hard it is for you to have to lie to someone for one conversation, to just sit with somebody and lie to them for 25 minutes or 35 minutes, right? Whether you're telling your parents why you were, you weren't, you know, lying or why your parents were, uh, missed curfew or why your homework was bad or, you know, whatever it might be, or lying to your spouse about how much money you spent at the casino. It's very difficult to lie even for just 20 minutes, but we are lying for weeks and months at a time. And they do that during training so that we can start to learn how to embrace that endurance element of sustaining a whole fictional life. And that's very challenging. So lying is a big part uh, about the whole spy uh, thing, right? Lying is the biggest part. That's it's it is the number one thing that you are. That's your superpower. That's your skill. It's being able to lie up uh, and lie in order to protect, but also lie in order to gain access to. Can you tell us some fundamental things about lying? Uh, how to do lying in the right way. Don't use it. People are, are watching, please. But it's good in theory to know and understand this. Maybe to <laughs> spot a liar, not not to become a liar. So I so here's what I'll tell you for sure on the fundamental side. Lying is actually very difficult. Uh, most of the people out there who think they are good liars are actually not good liars. They're they're actually lying to themselves about how hard lying really is. The people out there who are the most honest people, the people out there who can look you in the eye or, or who will say, raise their hand and say, lying is hard. Those are the people who actually possess the skills to be very, very good liars. And here's why. Because if you understand why lying is hard, then you already have an idea of what to look for in other people when you think they're lying to you. But when you think that lying is easy, You are blind to the difficulties of lying, which means that you don't even know what to look for in somebody else to see if they're lying. There's all sorts of of uh, Instagram posts and Twitter posts and stupid reels that try to tell you that you can identify if somebody's lying just by the direction of their eyes or by the looks on their face, sometimes called micro expressions. You cannot use micro expressions or eye movements as a as a reliable lie detection tool unless you have a baseline first a baseline means you have to understand how, what is a normal person's behavior i'm sure you've met people who have twitchy eyes who just they look around all the time and they have a hard time looking at you and they're they're moving their eyes constantly you can't you can't meet that person for the first time and then assume that they're lying just because their eyes twitch they may have social anxiety They may have an actual nerve issue. They may have vision issues. And that's what makes them lose control of their eyes. But when you understand a baseline, then you know to look for something different from the baseline. And that's the first kind of hint that you get that someone might be lying to you. So for us as liars, what that means is if you need, if you know you're going to tell a lie, the first It's thing so you have to do that. is... How, how normal is for you the life part for us liars to say it's, like, it's important <laughs> in your life. Anyway, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right, Fidias. There's 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 value in knowing how to do it. So when you know that you're about to tell a lie, the goal for you is to keep your behavior very consistent. If you're looking somebody in the eye when you're telling them the truth. You have to look them in the eye when you're telling them a lie. If you're not looking them in the eye because you're, you're looking at your watch or you're typing or you're doing something else, if you're telling them the truth while you're busy, you don't want to stop and look at them in the eye to tell them the lie. You should just continue with your normal behavior and then tell them the lie. Because someone who is very sensitive to lie detection, because some, some of us are just very gifted at knowing when people's behavior changes. Those people who are sensitive to lie detection will pick up very quickly, even on a subconscious level, they'll pick up on the fact that your behavior changed when you shared a certain piece of information. So you have to keep in are, mind this are consistency. Are you a good poker player? 
I'm not bad at poker. I don't I don't have the tolerance for poker. It takes a long time to play a poker game. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, continue. <laughs> So that's the the big thing you want to look for is that baseline. And then another very useful tool when it comes to liars, Phidias, is you want to you want to understand whether somebody is lying because they are intentionally trying to deceive you or whether somebody is lying because they feel a awkward sense of either not knowing information or an awkward need to say something. Or a lot of the times people say lies but they think they say the truth <laughs> it's fair it's fair people oftentimes don't realize how bad their communication is no 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 i'm not sure if you understood what i said a, a, a lot of people like say uh, uh say that feel and believe that they say the truth but that that they are saying lies because of lack of knowledge Correct. That's ignorance. I agree. So many times it's crazy. And like you believe them, you sense them, you are a hundred percent sure that they are saying the truth. And then because they are fucking retarded and they say, they saw that. <laughs> yeah, anyways, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and that's a big part of information warfare. Because if you can find those people who believe that something is true, but they're stupid and they don't ever test it and they don't ever actually understand it, If you can target those people and give them the information you want them to spread, then you have a whole army of what the what KGB used to call useful idiots, people who didn't understand what they were saying, but said it anyways. Or an example. So the vast majority of social media is people who don't actually know what they're saying, but who are spreading, sharing and commenting because of their own thoughts, opinions, and beliefs without actually vetting or testing the thing that they're looking at. You see it happen all the time with the spreading of newspaper stories or, or, or blogs or other Instagram or other uh, social media posts. Like you will see fake news spread like wildfire, you know, fake videos, false headlines, incomplete stories. You'll see it just take off because people are spreading, sharing, and commenting on something they don't understand. And you see the useful idiot effect happens all the time. And what's really interesting is, you know, social media has made it possible so that you could, in your comments on something, you could say, this is fake news. You could say, this is not real. You could say, this isn't true. But the algorithm behind the social media doesn't care what you say. All they see is that you engaged with the content. So then they continue to spread the content. So whether you're saying, I believe this and this is right, or whether you're saying this is fake and it's not real, the algorithm doesn't care. The Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube algorithm just spreads it further because now what it sees is that people are commenting. So it makes for a very difficult counterintuitive response. Whereas if you see something that's not real, the best thing to do is nothing. That way, the algorithm doesn't it doesn't look like you're engaging, liking, disliking, criticizing. Instead, it just looks like it's not interesting. And, and that's the reason of all these conspiracy theories in the last couple of years taking a uh, rapid fire and like spreading like wildfires over over the world because of what you're describing, right? Yep, exactly right. Because people find it interesting, amusing, entertaining, who knows what. And, and that's exactly what social media wants to do. The, uh, the end goal for every social media company is to keep you on their platform. Facebook wants you to stay on Facebook. They don't want you to leave Facebook. It, YouTube wants you to stay on YouTube. They don't want you to leave YouTube, right? So they, they purposely, the algorithm is designed to find the thing that is going to capture your attention next and feed you that thing. And that is a, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, complementary tool to information warfare. What, what do movies get uh, wrong about spies? So the number one thing that's, that movies get wrong about spies is it, it makes you think that spies are beautiful and spies are handsome and we're not. 
I mean, look at this is what a spy looks like. I've got a gigantic <laughs> nose. I've got a giant <laughs> forehead. Right. Come I'm, on. I'm not. I, I I'm not this like, is a plus. I don't have giant biceps and a perfect butt. I'm not six foot two. Like spies are not beautiful people because beautiful people can't blend in. <laughs> spies are heavy set. They have gray hair. They they <laughs> look goofy, right? Like that's what a spy is. A spy is a a normal person who does not look threatening. If someone looks threatening, they're the worst kind of spy because everywhere they go, people will notice them. You want someone who blends in. And the movies get that wrong all the time because movies have to have a beautiful star. They have to have a beautiful person for you to look at. So that's they always find the the fit male or fit female with a pretty face or the handsome face and the purple everything. You think that spies are getting turned off just because of their looks and their tone of voice. Exactly right. Exactly right. So a big part wow. of the reason that we have such a long process for application is because we need lots of different people to see the candidates before they even come in. And to say this person wow. would not blend in. This person this person would stand out in public. And that's a very real risk. Uh, what's another thing that movies get wrong? So another thing that movies get wrong is that spies are always super skilled at everything they do. They, they speak languages perfectly with certain, uh, uh, like cultural words and perfect accents and perfect pronunciation. They shoot weapons and they understand every weapon inside and out. Right. They're perfectly dressed. They drive a car with zero mistakes. You know, they can do stunts on motorcycles and boats. None of that is real. Spies are trained to the minimum standard because if again, if you're too good at something, it makes everybody wonder, why are you so good at this? Imagine me going into going into an African country and speaking in the native tribal dialect perfectly. Immediately, people are going to say, where did you learn to speak this dialect that perfectly? And why do you look the way you look? So imagine a Caucasian redheaded, you know, green eyed female going into Asia and speaking Thai perfectly. It's going to make everybody's eyebrows like raise. And they're going to say, who are you? How did you learn our language? Why are you so perfect? Just like with a beautiful person, somebody who's perfectly skilled at something is memorable. That person is noticeable. That person is suspicious. So whether you know how to use every weapon or whether you know how to drive a car at high speeds perfectly, no matter what the make or model is, like if you can drive through Rome and skid in a Lamborghini and never hit a single curb, all of a sudden it's like, how did this person learn to do that? And the, the answer that people start to lean on is there's something suspicious about you. You must be a spy because the only time I've ever seen someone be perfect is in a spy movie. So instead, we train to a minimum standard just enough to keep ourselves alive, just enough to understand what's happening around us, but not enough to be able to appear suspicious. So uh, that, do guns uh, have a big uh, involvement in your training or not as, as much as people think? Not nearly as much as people think. We are trained to use certain weapons only when our missions and our operations might put us in a position where we need to use the weapon. So in, in hostile areas, like in certain parts of Africa, in war zones, in uh, areas of active hostilities or in areas where weapons are common. Because in most parts of the civilized world, weapons are not common. The average person in Germany or France or Italy does not carry a weapon, right? The average person in China like Texas. or Texas. Correct. It's not like the United States. <laughs> so for the most part, we don't have to learn how to use a, a projectile kinetic weapon like a gun 
Instead, we learn how to defend ourselves with basic self-defense. We learn how to defend ourselves with weapons like batons. We learn how to defend ourselves with knives. But we don't learn how, we don't spend a great deal of time on guns specifically. Not anything like what you expect from a Navy SEAL or from a, a Green Beret or an Army Ranger. Uh, what are you not allowed to say? <laughs> a lot. About That's... your training. What are some stuff? Yeah, walk us through. <laughs> so it's, so in, in reality, there's not that much that we can't talk about. Uh, we joke a lot and people assume that there must be lots that we can't talk about. Um, and in a way, in a way you're right, but in a way you're wrong. So imagine, uh, imagine like college, you take a lot of courses in college. You take, uh, you know, credit hours, your freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year, four years worth of education. And you've taken maybe what, uh, 18 or 24 classes total right? Four or six classes per year, 24 to 30 classes, maybe total. If you were to compare that to my time at CIA, if there were 30 things that I could talk about, four of them are things I'll never be able to talk about. The other 26 I can, but the four things that I can never talk about are related to what we call sources and methods. A source, a source is a current source of intelligence collection. Right. So uh, the name of an officer, the name of a case, the name of a target, uh, the tool that's being used to collect information, whether it's a certain kind of who knows what phone tap or satellite or whatever else. Right. That's a source. We can never talk about sources. Methods are, again, related to the active method of intelligence collection. We use this tool in this country to collect this type of information. Right whether it's some, something that we do over radio transmissions or something that we do with a dead drop or something that we do with a, a brush pass or a personal meeting, whatever the different methods are that are currently being used in a certain way to collect current information, we can't ever talk about that. But the other 26 things we can talk about because they're not related to sources and methods, right? Gen general ideas about our training and what day-to-day -day life looked like and how you write an intel report and who you talk to and what career progression looks like and stresses and challenges and all that stuff. We can talk about that. What ends up happening, Phidias, is that for most of us, we are indoctrinated into the idea of just don't talk about anything. Because if you don't talk about anything, you'll never be, in, you'll never be at risk of accidentally talking about the four things you can't talk about. So most former CIA officers come out and we don't talk about anything. The reason that I've been able to gain some success outside of CIA, the reason my business has been successful, the reason that, that my YouTube presence and my social media presence has been successful is because I'm trying to focus on those 26 things that I can talk about. And nobody's ever heard anyone talk about those before. They, they are secrets, but not secrets that hurt the United States. They're just secret because no one has ever shared them. Not necessarily secret because they carry any kind of damage to CIA or the U.S. I, I would say the same about the Navy SEAL stuff, probably not out of 30, probably only the two, one, two you cannot talk about uh, publicly. So, uh, yeah, probably... A bit more in the CIA, the stuff that you can't talk about. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to, but, but you cannot talk about any specific cases, any specific stuff that you were involved uh, uh, and how did you solve and how did you do them? Um, you are not allowed to talk about these things? Correct. That's our operational history. And the way that we can talk about our operational history is we have to request permission from CIA to do that first. So as an example, my wife and I, my wife is also a former CIA officer. We are in the process of writing a book, a wow. memoir about our time at CIA. Wow. It has been, we've been wow. working on it for, for more than two years because every time we, we create a new chapter, we have to take it back to CIA. They have to review it. They have to approve it or disapprove of certain elements. And then we have to rewrite it. 
And in order for it to be legal, it takes this long, grueling process. Uh, and that's what we're in the middle of right now, because we're trying to find a way to share more of our operational background with the people who are following us. Okay, that's a, a lot to unfold right there. So I'm curious to see, uh, you have some interviews that you have millions and millions and millions of uh, views. Do the CIA like this thing because you are bringing popularity to the topic and you're inspiring the young generation to do this? Or they're like, ah, maybe he's saying too much or like it's dangerous to have, uh, like, how do they think about this? So it's, a, it's an interesting question because I actually just recently, within the last five or six days, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who's still connected inside CIA. And, the, and his feedback was that I came up in a conversation, in a, a group conversation about you know something operationally relevant, and the room was divided. Half the people in the room liked what I was doing. They liked that I was out there sharing with the American public, uh, saying good things about the type of hard work and heroism that's happening at CIA, because so many people leave CIA and say, say negative things. They talk about the inefficiencies and the conspiracies and the, and all the terrible things that CIA does. That's not my focus. My focus is on telling people that CIA does sometimes do horrible things, but they also do really amazing things and everything they do is there to protect the American people. So half the room was happy with me, but the other half of the room was not. And that half of the room thought that I should keep my mouth shut. They thought that I was profiteering off of CIA. I was just riding their coattails. Everybody loves CIA or everybody cares about CIA. Everybody thinks about CIA. So now I'm just wearing the CIA seal so that I can get people's attention. Um, and that we have a culture at CIA where the culture is all about discretion. So to be a real professional, you keep everything secret. When I left CIA and started my business, I immediately carried out the opposite of what they consider to be professional. I'm not being discreet. I'm being public. I'm being very selective. I'm being as professional as I can be about my commitments to keep CIA secrets but I am still very open and transparent about myself, my experiences, and what I believe is happening through my CIA training. So a lot of people at CIA see that culturally as me being a sellout, me being a, a fame hunter, me being whatever else it might be. So it's still very split, but to be, to be honest with you, Phidias, I'm kind of shocked that half the room liked me at all because I would have expected that I would just that most people would dislike me. But instead, I think it's very encouraging for for people to understand that there are many, many, many people at CIA who want to share more. But because they're still undercover, because they're still serving in government, they they simply can't. They're legally restricted from being able to speak about what they do for a living, contractually obligated by their their oath of office. Because I have left CIA, I am no longer under that oath of office. I am no longer contractually obligated to quiet, to, to, be, to keep the secrets. Now, I, it's in my discretion what I share and what I don't share. It's very interesting. I have a, a similar story of this because when I finished the Navy, see, because my country is very small, it's one million population. And I started making YouTube videos and Instagram videos. And when you start making YouTube videos and Instagram videos, your first videos are cringe, are, are like not good. And, and so a lot of the people back then in the army, my fellow Navy SEALs, they found mm -hmm. what I was doing cringe and that I was the de demoting the name of the Navy SEALs and putting it to, uh, to just, uh, uh, some stupid uh, clown things. But after uh, I started understanding how to make videos and like making successful YouTube videos about cool things, uh, the narrative changed and now they are kind of proud that I am, they, I'm like the face 
of the uh, Navy SEALs in my country. So it's it, it's interesting, the evolution. It took four or five years, <laughs> but it I'm, does. I'm happy. <laughs> and it feels good, right? I mean, even though it feels horrible when you're being criticized at the beginning, once you turn the corner and you have the opportunity to to get people's support and that people believe in you and you've proven yourself, then it feels very good. At least that's what it feels like for me. I'm imagining it's what it feels like for you. Yeah. And it's my pleasure to be the face of the public face of the Navy SEALs. It's like an honor. So I think you feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, it's a privilege. It really is a privilege. And, and I know, and I'm sure you know this too, we're the ones that will decide when we stop. Nobody else will decide when we stop. We decide when we turn yeah. it off. We decide when we stop creating new things. We decide whether something's interesting enough or not. And, and for me, that was a, that's a level of control and power I never had when I worked for CIA or when I worked for the U.S. military. Even when I worked for somebody else, they tell you when to go to work. They tell you what to do. They tell you when to show up. Now we work for ourselves and now we make an impact that's positive and one day we will stop. We just don't know when that day is, but what we do know is that it's up to us. How many years you were in the CIA? I was undercover from 2007 to 2014. Wow, that's a big chunk of your life. <laughs> it's a big chunk of my life, but I was fortunate. I was fortunate to meet my wife and my wife was also undercover, so she understood me, and I understood her, and that made life a lot easier. Can you tell me some stuff about this? Because it's uh, a lot of the times you don't want a person to come at the house and to be having the same problems that you had the same day. You want like to shift uh, and like talk about I don't know more normal things or something like. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see if you think that was a big plus that you. Because, but there is also the other side that then nobody understands you and you need a person to understand you. And maybe is that your situation is something like that about your loved one. So maybe touch a bit on that. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was like for us. If for, if for me, if I had to choose between having a wife that was undercover and inside CIA or a wife that was not inside CIA and had no knowledge, it would be very difficult to work with a wife who'd had no knowledge because she has no knowledge and there's things I can't tell her. So even if she asked me, tell me more, explain it to me, like, tell me why you're so stressed out or tell me why it's such a big deal or tell me, tell me how your boss hurt your feelings or, you know, why you're winning this award. You can't tell them. So, so that secrecy in any marriage, in any relationship, secrets, create a gap and the more secrets the further apart you grow yeah so for me having my wife being someone who understood yes we did have the pain of having similar problems and yes we had the pain of sometimes working together all day and then going home and having to work together at night too right so there was all that discomfort for sure but i would have but i would take that discomfort over the process of growing apart any day of the week. Because at the end, what ends up happening now, I'm 43 years old, my, my wife and I have been married for 13 years, and now we're like uh, we're like two gears you, you locked together. You are 43, oh my God, you don't look 43. Sorry for interrupting, continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks man, I appreciate that. But. I look much better on a camera that's not HD. <laughs> <laughs> but now our marriage is so much stronger because there's no history of, of secrets between us. If anything, we both know how to tell when the other person's lying. So we're, <laughs> we're too afraid to lie to each other. So it's just easier to tell the truth no matter how embarrassing or how painful it might be. So... Probably you shifted this now in your life because you said so many lies for a long period of time and it's stressful. Probably now you never say lies in your life, probably. And that's what I love, man. I don't have to lie anymore. Now, the, the lie that I most commonly tell is just the lie of silence. When people start saying something, 
and they 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 think that you agree with them even though you don't and you just keep your mouth shut and they keep talking and that's that's the biggest lie that i have nowadays because i find myself around some crazy people sometimes and i just have to sit there and and listen <laughs> crazy people in the everyday life you mean of oh, that you meet uh... crazy people in business crazy people in everyday life there's a lot of people who recognize me when i walk around i'm sure the same thing happens to you when when millions of people have seen your face they notice you at the airport they notice you at restaurants they notice you at train stations they notice you at grocery stores and and, and, and probably for you it's a bit a bit weird that because for example when they see me they are like i'm a, like a stupid youtuber they want to take a picture or something like that they ask me something but for you maybe they want you to demonstrate oh can you do this uh, spy kind of you are they are asking you some weird shit so. <laughs> they do they ask me some weird stuff sometimes man and a lot of times what they want to do is they want to express their opinion about something happening in the world So they'll come up to me and they'll be like, oh, hey, aren't you the CIA guy? Hey, here's what I think is happening in Israel. Hey, aren't you the CIA guy? Here's what I think is happening in Taiwan. And you're just like, okay, let's, I didn't ask your opinion, but I'm here. I'm a captive audience for three minutes before I politely take a selfie and walk away. Uh, what about the salary uh, of the uh, is uh, do are you allowed to say how much is it and like how bonuses works and all this stuff yeah it's all different so there are no bonuses uh because you know there's it's the government even if you kill people successfully there's no bonuses the, the <laughs> bonus that you that you the that was bonus a joke. That you get that was a joke that was a bad joke like <laughs> <laughs> The, the bonus that you get is promotion. And if you get promoted, you'll get you. You are eligible to request a promotion or to compete for a promotion every few years, maybe three, five, seven years, depending on how senior you are. But when I started in 2007, my starting salary was, I think it was $80,000. I think it was $80,000 in 19. I'm sorry, in uh, in 2007. And that sounds like a lot of U.S. dollars, except that the Washington, the Washington, D.C. metro area is one of the most expensive areas to live in. So as a single person on eighty thousand dollars a year, I was able to afford a small one bedroom apartment, a used car. And, you know, I had to pack my lunch every day. So it's it's not a very competitive salary where it starts to become comfortable is that once you are operational and you're living and working undercover, all of your expenses are paid for by whatever is providing your cover. So whether it's a, you know, a government organization or a commercial organization or something else, it pays for everything. So now your salary, whatever your salary is, is just going into your bank account and you can save it. But, uh, can you um, explain me who is paying for your stuff? Because I'm not sure uh, if I understood. It's the U.S. It's the U.S. taxpayer, right? Remember that black budget we yes, talked about? Yes, I, I, I know. I understood that. But the, the second part that you said, when you get free stuff, who is paying? I, I'm not sure if I understood. I still the CIA, but like uh, gov- it's like the black market that's that you, right. I don't know that you were yeah, explaining yeah, yeah. before. So that's where we're starting to get into a classified area. So I, it's, I can't give you the exact answer, but imagine this, imagine this, yes, right? This, I was hoping for to get to this point to a classified area that we cannot talk about because it's interesting to see the limits. So, so let's say that this is, this is me. Okay. Phineas, this is me. And then right here above me or beside me is my cover provider whatever it is that's providing cover for the operation, okay? This cover provider, whatever it might be, is paying all the expenses for me. So whenever somebody looks at me and they look at who I work for, just like if you if you worked for Shell Oil and you lived in Thailand, your house, your car, your drivers, your cooks would all be paid for by your company. So it's very, very common for your company to pay all of your expenses. Now, the difference is in government operations, there's a shell company or a shell organization as well. And that shell organization 
pays your company or pays your cover provider, and then your cover provider pays your expenses. And then that shell organization is oftentimes covered by two or three additional shell organizations before it's actually funded by the federal government. So the money moves seven or eight different times before it ever gets to you. And that's a very common practice and that's that's common in military, that's common in corporations, that's common in criminal activity, that's common in terrorist activity. But it's all a game of just moving the money so people might find one transaction, but they will not find all eight transactions. Interesting. I'm curious to hear uh, your answer to the question that we ask all the guests. I give you one trillion dollar. How do you spend it to have maximum impact, positive impact in the world? Wow. One trillion dollars to have maximum positive impact in the world. So I am going to, I'm probably going to disappoint you, man. I'm going to take that trillion dollars and I am going to invest it in the areas that I think will have the most significant growth for the American GDP. I'm going to carve off a small amount to protect myself and my family, of course, but then the vast majority of the rest of it, I'm pouring right back into the United States because I believe that a stable, strong United States is what will make for a strong and stable mankind, humanity, at least for the near future. And if I were to do something, something else with that trillion dollars, I don't know that I would really make much of a difference. It's better to have a strong United States than it is to buy a trillion meals for children in Africa. Because once those trillion meals are gone, they're gone. But if I invest it into, say, SpaceX or Tesla or green energy or new forms of agriculture or education, I can find ways to take that money and make that money work to make everybody better in the future. I understand. That's interesting. But... Uh You touched before as well on this. And as a person that I'm seeing the world with no country color, uh, I am not sure. Uh, uh, it's not that I disagree with you. What you are saying makes sense. But I want you to elaborate a bit more. Let's say if China or the India becomes the most powerful country. Also, I can say, you said before that United States is not perfect, but I can say a lot of examples, the Iraq war, the Ukraine war. Now is it's like a lot of examples that the you know, United States bring pain in the world. But also there is a lot of examples that because people are scared of the United States, they are not doing a war. So uh, I'm, I'm curious for you to elaborate more on this idea. Yeah, and let's let's be very honest, right? The United States is a young country, a very young country, right? So if you were to put, uh, if you were to compare the United States to a human being, we're basically a teenager, 14, 15 years old. So think about all the actors and all the musicians and all the celebrities who are just 14 or 15 years old, but they have tons of money. What do they do with their money? They waste it. They do stupid shit. They buy sports cars and they, they buy, you know, designer tennis shoes and big gold necklaces. Like they waste their money. They do stupid stuff with what could be really valuable resources. That's what the United States is. We are a very rich, very stupid 15 year old. However, There's lots of starving, angry, violent 15-year-old teenagers out there as well. And if they had even a little bit more resource, they would kill, they would steal, they would hurt. I would rather be a 15-year-old who's buying stupid tennis shoes than be a 15-year-old who kills my neighbor because I want to steal their tennis shoes instead, right? And unfortunately, that's a big part of the world that we live in. The world that we live in is a, is like a giant family. 
different countries have been allowed alive and around for different periods of time. China, as an example, is over 5,000 years old. The communist government is very young, even younger than the United States. So the communist government, Xi Jinping's government is like an eight year old. That's a child compared to the United States because they've only been around since 1949. But the UK has been around for, you know, thousands of years or not the UK, but the idea, the British idea has been around for a long time since when it was, since it was the kingdom of England, right? So you have these different countries that are like, here's a grandfather, here's a mother, here's a great grandfather or a great grandmother. Here's a, you know, a, a, a young adult, whatever it might be. All these different countries have different levels of national maturity or governmental maturity. When I look at all of that, it's just like, it's like a holiday dinner with your family. Not everybody's not going to get along. Somebody's going to make somebody else angry. Somebody's going to say something that hurts someone else's feelings and the kids are going to fight. That's just, it's guaranteed every holiday. That's what you're going to see. So the world is just like one giant holiday family get together. The difference is that right now, the 15 year old who has all the money, that's the person who comes in and is like, Oh, let's, I'll buy food. I'll buy alcohol. You guys don't have to fight. Like everybody just get along. Even if you don't like each other, just pretend you get along and I'll bring you all my money. That's essentially how the United States governs. What's happening is that people are starting to see that that is not a good governance model for the future because technology is making it so that more people can grow faster. I mean, India is a great example. If you look at India 25 years ago, it was very difficult for poverty stricken Indians to learn even how to read or write. But now in 2024, if they have a cell phone, they can learn to read or write. If one member of a 12 member household has a cell phone, three or four of the children will learn how to read or write, right? Technology is democratizing opportunity. It's making it so everybody has access to opportunity. Now what's happening is this, the United States and the way that we've been doing business for so long, we're realizing that we have to let the rest of the world grow up. We have to let the rest of the world succeed. And we don't know how to handle that. So you see the United States taking these steps to try to take away opportunity from people. You see the United States frustrating NATO by telling NATO what to do. And now Germany and France and Spain are saying, we don't really want to do what the United States says. We want to do our own thing. You see China. China is saying, we want to create our own technology. We want to be able to, to uh, outsource, to be a manufacturer of high tech goods instead of low, cheap goods. And in order to do that, we have to compete with the United States. So the United States puts all these uh, sanctions on technology. So China can't get access to that technology, which of course makes China steal from the United States and steal from Europe. But you can see that the United States is not sharing very well anymore. And that is a problem that I'm hoping will resolve itself as chi as the United States turns from 15 into say a 17 or 18 year old adult or a 21 year old adult and a proper world player. Right. Just like a good dad doesn't tell their children what to do. A good dad gives their children opportunities and then teaches them how to be a responsible citizen. OK, I understood. I understood your point about a good answer. Very uh, is good when you are giving examples uh, on the table and like when you meet with your friends and all this stuff is for my stupid brain to understand. <laughs> so uh, I am curious to understand how, okay, you finished all these five things. It was a big part of your life, part of your identity, but how do you live? Now, and uh, how does it affect it? How did it help or uh, sometimes uh, damage your life uh, in some ways? So a big part of my company, Everyday Spy, I actually started the company not because I wanted to be successful or wealthy, but because I was looking for some form of therapy to get myself through all of my own mental health challenges when I first left. 
because when you're trained to lie and you learn how to manipulate people, it's very, very easy to fall into a lifestyle where people are not equals. People are just toys and you're playing with them all the time. And the longer you stay at CIA, the more you see people as toys instead of people. So after seven years of myself being there, um, my wife and I became pregnant and I realized and we were going to have a son. And it struck me like in a moment of clarity, it struck me that my child was a person, not a plaything. And then it kind of struck me that I had been thinking about human. I've been thinking about human beings wrong from the day that I started CIA. I had been I'd been thinking about human beings the wrong way that instead of hurting people to help people, I can help people to help people. There's two ways of solving the same problem, right? So my wife and I chose to leave CIA. We had our first child. We went on to have our second child. And what I found is I, I had a job just working in corporate America. And I was succeeding in my job, not because I was good at being a corporate employee, but I was good at being a spy. I was still using people in the corporation to get <laughs> things done. And, uh, and I wanted to change that. So I started writing a blog. And if you read the blog on the Everyday Spy website, all that is is me. That's my personal therapy. Here's a skill. Here's how I use it. Here's why it works. Here's a skill. Here's why I use it. Here's why it works. And, you know, after two years of blogging and then I started a podcast and then I started making some very cringe YouTube videos, just like you said, just like you mentioned, right? It was my way of saying, hey, I don't want to hurt people anymore. Here's, here's the skills that I was taught to use against you. And now you can use them too for whatever you need to gain in your life. If you're trying to gain a promotion at work, if you're trying to gain uh, a true meaningful love of your life, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to start a business, here are all the skills. I don't want to have an unfair advantage anymore. Let me tell you my secrets. Because if you remember from the beginning of our conversation, a secret is an unfair advantage. I didn't want that anymore. So I just started sharing the secrets, every secret that I could share. And as I went through that process, what I discovered is that people were growing. People were, were taking those secrets and using them to have success in their own life. People were being were able to do things they could never do before because of something that I taught them that CIA taught me. And that became my company mission. My company's mission right now is to use spy education to break barriers for anybody willing to listen. That's our mission. Our mission is not to make money. Our mission is not to be famous. Our mission is not to change the world. Our mission is to educate people on spy skills that break barriers. That's it. Whether it's a financial barrier or a social barrier, a personal barrier, a relationship barrier, you name it. And we just want, we want to give you the skills to break those barriers. That's what I do now. And I feel so good about myself, man. Even though half of CIA doesn't like me, I still feel like I'm on a, an honorable mission that's making a real difference. Wow. <laughs> and now I think uh it's a, it's a good time i want i wanted to do this maybe off camera but maybe we can discuss a bit about it on camera i think for the people will be interested so uh we are thinking to make a collaboration video on the uh main channel that i have about something related to spies and i saw you sent me an example of another video that you did with another youtuber about spies uh, being a spy for 24 hours uh, but I was thinking, I was going to tell you, uh, I, I love the idea, but it needs to be something crazy. It needs to be like 48 hours, like a spy, seven days, like a spy is already be done. But, uh, I want maybe for us to think something, uh, I don't know, to make a whole operation. I don't care to give up 15 days, 20 days of my life to make, uh, to devote on this and like make an actual something that never been done before, but also 
without, because if we're going to do an operation and all this stuff, it's going, it's like, we're going to give away how you do operations in CIA. <laughs> so uh, I don't, I, I want uh, you as well to think about it, demonstrate what we are allowed and how we can make such a thing that also it would be a huge clickbait. Like, uh, we can find uh, that out, but also something that was never done before really in the related with CIA. And I don't know, maybe it can be, if you don't want to spend too much time of this, for, like me that I'm stupid, that spending 20 days without uh, anything, doing anything, just focusing on the YouTube video, maybe you, you can give me some directions and all this stuff so I can do it. I, and I'm down to go to any country, spend any money on this video and stuff to, uh, it sounds like very fun, uh, to, and also the learning process, as you mentioned, like I have a skill of the discipline and all this stuff. I'm curious to learn about and show the world, all the stuff that you are teaching as well, uh, about the everyday spy company and all this stuff. So I, I like where you're going with this video. So what I would say is let's start thinking through a, a multi-week undercover operation where you're not you. We change your identity and we put you somewhere in a different identity where you create a completely new persona. That means whether you get a job or whether you start a company, whether you do whatever, you create a whole persona that people... People think that your name is Jacob and you and Jacob makes friends and Jacob lives day after day as Jacob working towards some specific secret that Jacob is trying to get. Right. Jacob is trying to learn the secret about whatever it might be, the secret recipe of some special soup that they only make in Porto, Portugal. And now here's here's Jacob, the whatever, the tailor who's not a very good tailor because you probably don't know how to tailor yet, <laughs> but you have to build a whole operation around getting to that secret, which means you have to meet people. You have to make those people like you. You have to get those people to introduce you. You have to find a way to make money because if you don't make money, you won't survive because you can't pay yourself because you're not Phidias anymore. You're Jacob, right? And we could build a whole operation and you could document the entire thing. That could be a ton of fun. And that would be a chance for us to show people how an operation is built and executed without compromising any of the real secrets that CIA uses. Okay, I'm, I'm done. We need to think about the scenario to be like, oh my God, they did this. To uh, When someone hears it, it needs to be like that. Right. So if we find the scenario like that, I will think about it. I will put, I have a person that thinks ideas for the YouTube channel and we're going to brainstorm a bit and send you some ideas and uh, you will send us some ideas back. And maybe in the second part of the year 2024, uh, we can make it happen. Uh, that would be awesome, man. That would be awesome. <laughs> and then we could, I can see also, we could have multiple training days and we could have, It's that could be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, and I'm not sure if this was interesting for people to listen, but I thought it, because we were going to have this conversation off camera, I thought it would be fun for some people to see what we we're going, what we're going to talk off camera. So, uh, and now uh, if they if they did like it, we should get comments. Send us comments. Send us ideas if you like this idea. If you like the way this yes. is going, Co comments down know, below. Yeah, this is one of your smaller channels right now, Phidias. So I don't know that many people will even know that we're doing this. No, I think you are you are a big name. So we're going to get some viewers. And I also maybe I will promote it to the main channel as well because what we discussed, it's interesting for my viewers. Uh, because the other podcast on this channel is about consciousness and the meaning of, <laughs> that nobody cares uh, of the younger people. But this is something that... <laughs> People will find it interesting. So uh, another, uh, the way that we end this podcast, it's a speci special way that you're going to die after this podcast. And let's say if you die in 40, 50, 100 years from now, we're going to have a uh, look back to your last words. So you have 40, 50 seconds to broadcast a message, I don't know, to your family, to your people uh, to the people that you never met or to the audience for people to have 
uh, your message, your last words. To my loving wife and my incredible children, everything that I've ever been proud of is tied to you. And if there's one thing in my life that I hope I accomplished, it was showing you how much I love you and, and how great it is to have an opportunity to have known you and to have been part of your life because so many people in this world will never know what it's like to be loved the way that you have loved me and they will never know what it's like to love someone the way that I've loved you. And even though so much of what I do is silly and and criticized and people don't understand what drives me, I know that every minute I've been away from you has been heartache and every minute that I've been with you has been joy. So understand that my life, my life was fulfilled the moment that I met the three of you and everything since then has been just a joy. It's been a bonus and everything that I can do to keep that bonus going is, is worth it. And it's why I've done what I've done, why I've accomplished what I've accomplished. Uh, and I, I would have never been able to do it without you. Sorry, Phidias, that was, uh, that actually wow. got very real. For me. <laughs> <laughs> this is beautiful words to close the podcast. Thank you for your time. You are amazing. Thank you, Phidias. Take care, sir.